Hi, Randall. How are you going? Hi, very good, thank you. Nice to see you again. Yeah, excellent. Yes, uh, we've had a few uh, technical issues with um, Skype, but now that seems to be res resolved. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, now, it's interesting that you've had some background in physics before. You uh, got interested in neuroscience. You started out in physics. Um, so what inspired you to actually move from physics to neuroscience? Well, it was really a practical choice that came after some maneuvering and navigating. Um, the goal that I had in mind, which of course now is, is whole brain emulation or substrate independent minds, has pretty much been the same for a long time, basically since I was 13 years old. Um, but at the time, when I first had that goal, um, I sort of had a combination of inspiration from a novel I read by Arthur C. Clark, which also had a very physics-based approach, and my own background, he's a particle physicist, so to me it just seemed normal or natural that when you wanted to deal with things like how to replicate something, that this would be something would, where you would have to look at atoms and, and materials like that, and look at things at a physical level. And of course that's not wrong, because we're always going to deal with physics, it's just that sometimes the abstraction level you want to look at is a little different, and that's something that I started realizing um, once I really dug into the matter, because uh, it turned out that, even while studying physics, that the things I was most interested in had more to do with the mind and the brain. So then, having that physics background, that mathematical background, the logical switch for me was to look at neural networks and artificial intelligence. So I ended up doing a master's in electrical engineering with an information theory uh, component in there. But then, while I was doing that master's, uh, I realized that um, I really needed a much deeper understanding of the human brain at a circuit level and specifically biological brains and at that point I decided to do my PhD in computational neuroscience and I think it's not an unusual trend we see a lot of other people doing the same thing where they're kind of coming out of an exact sciences background like physics and then entering neuroscience because it's a very cool cutting-edge area to do new things and it seems to be easier often than the other way around yeah, that's interesting. Like, I, I, I do agree with this trend to moving towards uh, computational neuroscience. I've picked up a course myself. And it seems as though it's a practical thing. It's like taking, like, you know, the amazing um, possibilities that understanding intelligence uh, can bring. But also, it's mm -hmm. a very practic practical thing. So it's not it's just theoretical. Physics seems to be very theoretical, right? Often, yeah. you know. And yeah. it's very hard to, like, um, build something with just a background yeah. in physics it needs to be sort of uh, um, joined up but, but it seems to be like an awesome background to understand biology and how the brain works really mm -hmm. it's actually funny that uh, the computational neuroscience is often it's it's automatically classified as theoretical neuroscience and that makes it seem like it's not the practical one not the one that you would apply much but I think the opposite is true. The theoretical or computational neuroscience is the most applicable one versus things that are more abstract and vague. Um, it's like saying that uh, if you want to understand how a car works or to fix a car, you know, you want to dig in and you want to understand how the mechanisms work and how they all fit together and what you need to take out and put in if you want to make something work. And that's really what computational neuroscience is. It's, it's understanding the circuit level of what's going on. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So, do you think that uh, theoretical neuroscience or computational neuroscience, as they seem to be um, close to each other, will ever have something like uh, the fundamental laws and awesome, awesome predictive power of uh, the theoretical sides of physics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that is already happening, in fact. Uh, every time that you see people treat neuroscience as an information science, then those sort of I guess you can call them laws, but maybe rules or, or regular uh, <laughs> functions that you would apply. They, they, they sort of come, I mean, physical laws, it, that's also, you know, the word law, that's a term that is applied, but it's, it's really just a set of hypotheses that have been tested rigorously and are agreed upon by consensus that they're pretty rigorous and reliable, then it becomes a law. But it could always be disproved. And the same sort of thing is true in neuroscience, of course. Uh, but if you look at information science, uh, at, at neuroscience from the computational neuroscience perspective, then you can see things such as, for example, um, in the architecture of neural networks, 
neuronal networks. You see a power law in the branching of axons and dendrites. That's something that's fairly predictive of how many dendrites you're going to find, how far away from the, the cell body of a neuron. Then there are things about the dynamic functions within neural circuitry that are predictable using rules and laws, such as the use of global recurrent inhibition as a mat matter of uh, uh, systematizing what's going on in this entire large structure that is the brain. Um, functions like the after hyperpolarization of a neuron, the fact that you cannot fire right after a previous spike, um, spike timing dependent plasticity, and many others. So as soon as you have mathematical descriptions of the processes that are going on, and as we keep on making those more detailed, we gain more predictive power. And um, yeah, I think uh, that, that thing, one, there's one thing though that's a little different. Uh, when I think back to how people treat systems in physics, at least the ones that you come across in your school textbooks, what you see mostly is that as soon as you start dealing with more elements, when you have a lot of particles, for example, it becomes easier to predict what's going on in the system. Think of a gas, for example, where you, know, you can treat the entire gas as one. You don't have to look at the motion of every molecule in the gas. Uh, when you look at um, biology or neuroscience from the computational perspective, that's not necessarily so because the more components you have, the more complex the system can become, even though when you get down one level, when you go down to a more fundamental level, you can see that again, say you have an ensemble of neurons, a group of neurons working together is more predictable than a single neuron that has an unreliable um, firing threshold and unreliable synapses and all that sort of thing. So the same thing applies at some levels but at another level where the complexity is more important, it seems like it's going the opposite way. It becomes more complex the more, part, more components you have. Um, and that's something that uh, actually a friend of mine, Dr. Robert Cannon, once called the difference between hot and cold systems. And, uh, and it was included in a publication that we did a couple of years ago. Right. So, so would you say that computational neuroscience is more about trying to understand the um, the finer grained actions of like individual neurons, but not, but and less so about population level effects. Well, I wouldn't say. I'd say that it is something you do at both levels. It depends on what you're interested in, um, because in some cases a single neuron will have a big impact on a function that is being carried out or on receiving sensory information. And sometimes it's really just ensembles that you're interested in. It really depends on which part of the system you're looking at, what function, and so forth. Computational neuroscience can be applied in each of those areas, just like you can apply mathematical modeling all across the sciences. Yeah, so it's, it, well, it seems as though there's been strides made. But there have been some sig significant advances in the last 10 years, even more, right? Um, and a lot of other neuroscientists have been like talking about this. For instance, um, Terence Stanowski came to Australia. He had some very interesting s things to say about mm -hmm. the advances in the last uh, ten years at the time when he came, which was a few years ago now. So, what do you? Well, I'll ask you then. What, what do you think are some of the most significant advances in mm -hmm. neuroscience and computational neuroscience and understanding the brain in the last ten years? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Terry Sinoski is an, an excellent researcher and a very good person to speak about how things have progressed over the years because he's been around for a number of stages that, that neuroscience has gone through over time. Um, I don't really have a perfect list of, say, the biggest things that have happened in the last 10 years, but I would say that overall what I've seen is that we have a much better understanding of the out. We have that at a macro scale when we look at diffusion tensor MRI, at a micro scale when we're looking at these uh, electron microscope slices giving us a very clear picture of how things are put together in the brain. And then there's our ability to read from and stimulate neurons, which has of course increased, uh, improved a lot with things like optogenetics where we're able to stimulate very specific neurons. So the, the biological tool set as well as the physical tool set, they've both improved on the biological side. Um, we can now use various kinds of voltage dependent proteins and other labeling methods to visualize exactly what you're trying to look at. Sometimes multiple types of uh, neurons for instance and, and their dendrites and axons uh, like with the brainbow technique that was developed by Jeff Lichtman. 
And uh, so, yeah, we understand more about the different types of systems and the di different types of components that are in the brain, that sometimes they work in one way and sometimes in another. For example, sometimes cells will have a will only represent one thing. This is this notion of the grandmother cell that just recognizes your grandmother. And sometimes there's a distributed storage. The, the, this is, of course, a simplification again, because the reason why there are different types of cells or the way cells act differently in their system is because they're all part of a system that has many different stages in it. So, for example, this grandmother cell, it's basically a queue that can, get, that can co connect over to... Um, a, a bunch of other neurons that are in a pattern somewhere using something distributed. Oh, well, one second. I am actually, there's someone knocking on my door right now, so I'm <laughs> going to have to. Notice that. For a second. Yeah, sorry about that.